Hello everyone. So we are on chapter 69 of the Count of Monte Cristo. Only two chapters after this one. The next video is going to be pretty long <clears throat> because the next chapter is very long. So chapter 69, expiation. The court had risen, and as the Procode Roy drove home through the crowded streets, the tumultuous thoughts of the morning surged through and through his weary brain. His wife, a murderess. Doubtless she was at this moment recalling all her crimes to her memory and imploring God's mercy. Perhaps she was writing a letter asking her virtuous husband's forgiveness. Suddenly he said to himself, that woman must live. She must repent and bring up my son, my poor son, the sole survivor of my unfortunate family, except for the indestructible old man. She loved him. It was for him that she committed the crimes. One must never despair of the heart of a mother who loves her child. She will repent, and no one shall know of her guilt. She shall take her son and her treasures far away from here, and she will be happy, for all her happiness is centered round her love for her son, and her son will never leave her. I shall have done a good deed, and that will ease my mind. The carriage stopped in the yard. He stepped out and ran into the house. When passing Notier's door, which was half open, he saw two men, but he did not trouble himself about who was with his father. His thoughts were elsewhere. He went into the salon. It was empty. He rushed up to her bedroom. The door was locked. A shudder went through him, and he stood still. Eloise, he cried, and he thought he heard some furniture move. Eloise, he repeated. Who is there? cried a voice. Open quickly, called Villefort. It is I. But... Notwithstanding the request and the tones of anguish in which it was made, the door remained closed, and he broke it open with a violent kick. Madame de Villefort was standing at the entrance to the room which led to her boudoir. She was pale and her face was contracted. She looked at him with a terrifying glare. Eloise! Eloise! he cried. What ails you? Speak! The young woman stretched out her stiff and lifeless hand. It is done, monsieur, she said with a rattling which seemed to tear at her very throat. What more do you want? And with that, she fell her full length on the carpet. Villefort ran up to her and seized her hand, in which held, which held in a convulsive grasp the glass bottle with a gold stopper. Madame de Villefort was dead. Frantic with horror, Villefort started back to the door and contemplated the corpse. My son, he called out, where is my son? Edward, Edward. He rushed out of the room calling out, Edward. Edward, in tones of such anguish that the servants came crowding round in alarm. My son, where is my son, cried Villefort. Send him out of the house. Do not let him see. Monsieur Edward is not downstairs, monsieur, said the valet. He is probably playing in the garden. Go and see quickly. Madame called her son in nearly half an hour ago, monsieur. Monsieur Edward came to Madame and has not been down since. A cold sweat broke out on Villefort's forehead. His legs gave way under him, and thoughts began to chase each other across his mind like the uncontrollable wheels of a broken clock. He came into Madame de Villefort's room, he murmured, as he slowly retraced his steps, wiping his forehead with one hand and supporting himself against the wall with the other. Edward, Edward, he muttered. There was no answer. <clears throat> Villefort went farther. Madame de Villefort's body was lying across the doorway leading to the boudoir in which Edward must be. The corpse seemed to guard the threshold with wide, staring eyes, while the lips held an expression of terrible and mysterious irony. Behind the body, the raised curtain permitted one to see into part of the boudoir, <clears throat> an upright piano and the end of a blue satin sofa. Villefort advanced two or three steps, and on this sofa, no doubt asleep, he perceived his child lying. The unhappy man had a feeling of inexpressible joy. A ray of pure light descended into the depths in which he was struggling. All he had to do was step across the dead body, take the child in his arms, and flee far, far away. He was no longer the exquisite degenerate typified by the man of modern civilization. He had become like a tiger wounded unto death. It was not prejudice, he now feared, but phantoms. He jumped over his wife's body as though it was, were a yawning furnace of red-hot coals. Taking the boy in his arms, he pressed him to his heart, called him, shook him, but the child made no response. He pressed his eager lips to the child's cheeks. They were cold and livid. 
He felt the stiffened limbs. He placed his hand over his heart. It beat no more. The child was dead. Terror-stricken, Villefort dropped upon his knees. The child fell from his arms and rolled beside his mother. A folded paper fell from his breast. Villefort picked it up and recognized his wife's handwriting and eagerly read the following. You know that I have been a good mother, since it was for my son's sake that I became a criminal. A good mother never leaves her son. Villefort could not believe his eyes. He thought he must be losing his reason. He dragged himself toward Edward's body, examined it once more <clears throat> with the careful attention of a lioness contemplating its cub. Then a heart-rending cry escaped his breast. God, he murmured, it is the hand of God. Villefort rose from his knees, his head bowed under the weight of grief. He, who had never felt compassion for anyone, decided to go to his father so that in his weakness, he would have someone to whom he could relate his sufferings, someone with whom he could weep. He descended the little stairs with which we are acquainted and entered Notier's room. As he entered, Notier appeared to be listening attentively and as affectionately as his paralyzed body would permit to Abbe Bussoni, who was as calm and as cold as usual. On seeing the Abbe, Villefort drew his hand across his forehead. The past all came back to him, and he recollected the visit the Abbe had paid him on the day of Valentine's death. You here, he said. Do you never appear except hand in hand with death? Busoni started up. I came to pray over the body of your daughter, replied Busoni. And why have you come today? I have come today to tell you that you have made abundant retribution to me, and from today I shall pray God to forgive you. Good heavens, cried Villefort, starting back with a look of terror in his eyes. That is not Abbe Busoni's voice. <clears throat> no, said the Abbe as he tore off his false tonsure. His long black hair full, fell round his manly face. That is the face of Monte Cristo, cried Villefort, a haggard look in his eyes. You are not yet right. You must go still further back. That voice... That voice, where have I heard it before? You first heard it at Marseille 23 years ago, on the day of your betrothal to Mademoiselle de saint Marin. You're not Boussonet, nor yet Monte Cristo. My God, you're my secret, implacable mortal enemy. I must have wronged you in some way at Marseille. Woe is me. You are right. It is so, said the Count, crossing his arms over his broad chest. <clears throat> Think, think. But what did I do to you? cried Villefort, whose mind was struggling on the borders between reason and insanity, and had sunk into that state which is neither dreaming nor reality. What have I done? Tell me, speak. You condemned me to a slow and hideous death. You killed my father. You robbed me of liberty, love, and happiness. Who are you then? Who can you be? I am the ghost of unhappy wretch you buried in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If. At length, this ghost left his tomb under the, under the disguise of the Count of Monte Cristo and loaded himself with gold and diamonds that you might not recognize him until today. Oh, I recognize you. I recognize you, cried the procureur du Roy. You are, I am Edmond Dantes. You are Edmond Dantes, cried the magistrate, seizing the Count by the wrist. Then come with me. He dragged him up the stairs, and the astonished Monte Cristo followed him, not knowing where he was leading him, though he had a pre presentiment of some fresh disaster. Look, Edmond Dantes, said Villefort, pointing to the dead bodies of his wife and son. Are you satisfied with your vengeance? Monte Cristo put, turned pale at the frightful sight. Realizing that he had passed beyond the bounds of vengeance, he felt he could no longer say, God is for me and with me. With an expression of indescribable anguish, he threw himself on the child's body, opened his eyes, felt his pulse, and rushing with him into Valentine's room, locked the door. My child, de Villefort cried out. He has taken the body of my child. Oh, curse you, curse you in life and death. He wanted to run after Monte Cristo, but his feet seemed rooted to the spot, and his eyes looked ready to start out of their sockets. He dug his nails into his chest until his fingers were covered with blood. The veins of his temples swelled and seemed about to burst through their narrow limits and flood his brain with a deluge of boiling fire. 
Then, with a shrill cry, followed by a loud burst of laughter, he ran down the stairs. A quarter of an hour later, the door of Valentine's room opened, and the Count of Monte Cristo reappeared. Pale, sad of eye, and heavy of heart, all the noble features of that usually calm face were distorted with grief. He held in his arms the child whom no skill had been able to recall to life. Bending his knee, he reverently placed him beside his mother with his head upon her breast. Then rising, he went out of the room and, meeting a servant on the staircase, asked, Where is Monsieur de Villefort? Instead of replying, the servant pointed to the garden. Monte Cristo went down the steps and, approaching the spot indicated, saw Villefort in the midst of his servants with a spade in his hand, digging the earth in a fury and wildly calling out, Oh, I shall find him. He may pretend he is not here, but I shall find him, even if I have to dig until the day of the last judgment. Monte Cristo recoiled in terror. He is mad, he cried. And as though fearing that the walls of the accursed house would fall and crush him, he rushed into the street, doubting for the first time whether he had the right to do what he had done. Oh, enough, enough of all this, he said. Let me save the last one. On arriving home, he met Morel, who was wandering about the house at the Champs-Élysées like a ghost waiting for its appointed time to enter the tomb. Get yourself ready, Maximilian, he said to him with a smile. <clears throat> we leave Paris tomorrow. Have you nothing more to do here, asked Morel. No, replied Monte Cristo, and God grant that I have not already done too much. So, sorry about the scratchy voice, but nothing was working. Um, yeah. There are some moments where the phrase, be careful what you wish for, really is true. I'll see you guys next time.